Now, here's what happened. When Laurie and I got started on this, we tossed a coin to see who would be the contract don'ts, and I lost. <laughs> so I'm the one that's going to submit a contract representing buyers to Lori as a listing agent, and I'm going to do it incorrectly so that we can demonstrate how it should be done. So let's get started. All right. Okay, first of all, who's involved? And I want to also say at this point that I'm using a form that is dated in 2012. Correct. And as you know, we just had a form change. So you Oh should. no, did we? Yes, we did. <laughs> So you should be using the new form. If you were using one from February, you're using the old form. So you should be using the new one. Okay, so who's involved? In the first part right here, I've got my buyers, but I just left the seller blank. I hope that's okay. Well, <laughs> it's a good way to find out who's the seller. It's really better to do that. And so by doing that, you can always check your county appraisal tax districts. You can also go on to Realtist. Calling the listing agent is always a good idea. But another thing too you should consider, if you are the listing agent, one thing that you want to check on are some seller situations when you're at the listing table. For example, if they're divorced, do you have a divorce decree? If you have two people that are living in the property and own the property, however, they're partners or they're not married, then you need to find out, are they both there? If they're estranged, will one of them be able to sign because they may have claimed that as a homestead and therefore have a right to that property. If there's a death, has it been probated? If not, your client is not gonna be able to move in in 30 to 45 days. So you need to find out various things about seller situations, if it's trust, if it's an estate, corporations, business owned, things like that. So always go to the listing agent, but you can always go to these sources as well. Okay, thanks. Well, I'll do that. You're welcome. Next time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, exclusions. I put in there that we're excluding the uh, mineral rights because that's what I usually see in here, and that's what I think the seller wanted to do because he mentioned it because he was there when we looked at the property. Ah, okay. Well, the interesting thing about exclusions is let's read this paragraph just so we can get a little clarity. As you know, it says that whatever is there will be retained by the seller and must be removed prior to delivery of possession. Oh, so, so if you put mineral rights, how do we remove that? I yeah, <laughs> don't think you can be digging with your hands and pulling those mineral rights out and taking them off to Good the next point. place. Good point. So please don't put mineral rights in there. There is a form for that. There but, is a mineral reservation form. And but that's we can what you should put... Use all potted plants on the back patio and we can put the play set in the backyard and absolutely yard art all the flamingos that were in the front <laughs> that's correct and the curtains if there's any special curtains that right. we want to keep anything that is normally listed in paragraph one or two that you plan on taking mm -hmm. that should be the place for you to notate exclusions now you're going to find this on the mls sheet because listing agents we need to include that on the mls sheet under in exclusions and then that needs to be translated over to the contract because if it gets missed guess what it's not excluded you might be buying a flat screen tv in brackets if you didn't right. put that in there <laughs> but i did know of a case where a seller took their shrubs right and so could we exclude shrubs um well that's a great question and the answer is yes if you're going to take grandma's rose bush or your aunt's wisteria, as long as you exclude that and you notate it in MLS and you also notate it on here, you can take it because like you pointed out in paragraph two, it talks about you will leave the shrubbery. Yes, you will leave the shrubbery. Don't be digging <laughs> that up. That's true. Okay, now in the next section, there's third party financing. Okay. And I'm, I did put in the amount of the loan in section A Okay. Did I miss something? Well, let me ask you this. Um, they are doing a third party financing and therefore we're going to need what? An addendum? Correct. <laughs> the third party financing addendum. So just to let you know, in third party financing you have two pieces to this puzzle. You have the property which has to satisfy the lender's underwriting requirements, which could be appraisal. 
and insurability, and then you have the credit approval, which is really strictly for the buyer being credit worthy to purchase the property. Now, just to let you know, if you check box two, you need to check A or B. Mm -hmm. If you check box B, just understand that you could be putting your client at risk. It may be a stronger opportunity, but it could be putting your buyer at risk. Okay, so then I should check box 2A since I want this to be subject to approval for financing. Okay, Correct. got it. Correct. All right, well let's move on to the next page because you were questioning me about this section, the title policy. Right. And this has changed and because it changed and I don't really get it, I just checked that first box. Right. Um, one thing that you need to understand is we did get additions to paragraph uh, 6, clause 8. And the interesting thing is in any title policy you get, you're going you're gonna to have probably 10 items that are automatic exclusions. And part of those are encroachments, boundary issues, shortages. Now, we do have insurance that you can purchase in addition to the title policy which actually would allow you to give your client a little bit better coverage. And so you can either amend it or not amend it. So if you click will not be amended, that means you're just buying the title policy as is, you're not caring about the shortages or anything else. But if you do amend it, then you're purchasing that extra information. Now, that being said, either party can pay for it we are not title people. So get with your title company. It is a T19.1 is the form. And what it does is it just allows for coverage. You have two pieces of coverage that you can get, two steps. One is just amendments for the shortages or encroachments. And then you have another policy that actually adds more coverage for them. And this could be after the fact. Um, if anything happens to the property or any damage to the property, it adds a little more coverage. And the max is 10%. Of the title policy premium? Correct. Okay, so it's not 10% of the sales contract price? Correct. It's just the policy premium. So you may be talking less than $100. Exactly. Okay. And that's well worth it. It is well worth, worth it. it. So to represent a buyer and to get them as much protection as possible, I want to check will be amended to read. Correct. I want to check that second box and then I can determine with them and negotiate whether the buyer or the seller will pay for that. But I'm protecting my buyer to check that second box, correct? That's correct. Gotcha. And okay. you always want to protect your I always client. want to protect my client. That's right. Okay, the survey and the T47. I didn't see a survey online, so I'm going to ask for one within two days after the effective date of the contract and I want the seller to pay for it. Okay. So what do you want to tell me about that? Yes. Okay, so with the survey, you have three options. You can have the seller provide existing, you can have the buyer pay or the seller pay. Just to let you know that, of course, it has to be done by a registered land surveyor, and if the seller furnishes it, he not only needs to furnish the survey, but also the T-47 affidavit. So if he doesn't have a survey, he doesn't have to do the T-47. That's correct. However, let me throw this at you as well. If you have checked box one and the seller does not have a survey, then it lets you know that the seller will have to pay for that survey because in the bold letters it says if the seller does not give you a survey within the time prescribed then at their expense no later than three days prior to closing they have to pay for a new survey. So listing agents understand if you get this checked and you don't have one then your seller will be paying for a survey. <laughs> so you need to be checking that you don't have one or if you do, let someone know, I do have a survey, and you can add that to the uh, Netra stocks. Now, on here, if, you, if it's not acceptable, then the seller or the buyer can pay for the survey, just to let you know. Gotcha. Okay. So, two days. Are you going to get this to me within two days? No, and that's a great question, too. How many days should you allow? So, typically, with your seller supplying the survey, I would give them enough time like through the option period or for the disclosure period. 
But if you're going to have to get a new survey, you're going to want to, you know, schedule that time after the option period. Because we don't want to be spending money that we don't need to spend, especially if you're not going to move forward. Got it. Okay, good point. Okay, now, you also called this into question in objections. And I just want to say, Lori, I've been doing this for 30 years. And I don't know why you're questioning this because I've always put single family residence in that blank. <laughs> I know, I know. And you know, I get this, I get this all the time. Um, this is probably the most misused paragraph that we have in the whole contract. And the reason why is because if we look at the wording in this, it says the buyer can object in writing to defects, exceptions, or encumbrances to the title disclosed on the survey or any other items in 6A1 through 7 and anything disclosed in the commitment, okay, which prohibit the use or activity of this property. Now, that being said, once you collect all the documentation, you're going to know pretty much covenants, restrictions, what you can and what you can't do, what you can have and what you can't have. So we see all the time people putting things like single family residential or residential. Well, first of all, if you continue to write things in the blanks that are already in the contract, you could be considered practicing law without a license. Now, if you get caught with doing that, then you will lose your license. So we don't want to do that, right? <laughs> so one thing that you want to make sure is that you don't put single family or residential. Because the contract is actually a one to four family residential, residential contract. contract. Exactly. Gotcha. So you don't really have to, you know, reiterate that fact. That must have just changed because I've been doing it for 30 years. <laughs> I know. And it, it's interesting. Now, one thing that you should put on there, and this is something that a lot of times people don't really think about, is this is where you have that crazy conversation with your buyer. Um, what do you way, plan to do with this property? There you go. And some things that you should consider is, um, are they planning to install a pool? Or a storage shed? Right. Or add a carport? Right. Or what about that pig in Keller? Exactly. And you know, it's interesting because some people have exotic pets. And there may be a situation where the city is not going to allow that. So, for example, let's say they have a pet pig, a pet, pet you know, potbelly pig. We actually had a case in Keller. The woman purchased a property, moved in, moved her dear pet in with her, was walking around in the backyard, and a neighbor called animal control saying, there's a pig in the backyard. And, of course, she was cited because you cannot have swine in the city limits. So had this been put on paragraph D, once she had that information, she could have backed out of the contract. That's a great suggestion. You either don't have a pig as a pet or just have that conversation and make sure you <laughs> put it down in that blank. Absolutely, because you don't want to give up your pet. Let's face it. Folks. Exactly. I don't want to give up mine. <laughs> okay. Property condition. You are also questioning me about this because I want to be sure that we have a general home inspection. So I checked box two and said that you would have it. We want to have this house subject to inspection. Okay. And right here, it's interesting because we do have a little paragraph down here that says what? Oh, I see. <laughs> do not insert general phrases such as subject to inspection that do not identify specific repairs and treatments. So is this where I should have put that they need to replace that, they need to repair that hole in the ceiling in the dining room? Exactly. If you're taking the property, even though it says as is, it still doesn't preclude you from having a home inspection and even asking for repairs that you consider I have to have or I won't move in. Um, but over here, paragraph two is basically for you to put things during the property tour. For example, you've walked you walk through the property, there's torn carpet, like you said, there's a hole in the window, there's a broken window. So it's things that you notice as you're touring the property. 
And those are the things that you would put in 72. Anything that can be seen visually as we go through the house. Exactly. Gotcha. Okay. Such exactly. as if we're having, if we have an FHA buyer and there are broken windows, we can address those up front mm -hmm. knowing that there, it's going to be required. Exactly. And that's a good place to put things like that, especially if it's a particular uh, loan type, because you know that there are going to be certain things that are going to be cited. Mm -hmm. So why not just go ahead and address them now and let the seller take care of it? Gotcha. Okay. I think I'm clear on that one. Now, property repairs. I've always just used Uncle Bob's handyman service for everything, and of course I'm on the buyer side, not on the listing side, so in this case it's changed. It looks like I can't use Uncle Bob to do the electrical box replacement or movement of the box. Is that correct? That is correct. Um, this changed this year with the new contract and it does say unless otherwise agreed in writing then all repairs must be performed by either a licensed person or someone who commercially is engaged in that trade so before the buyer has their inspection and the seller notates that something needs to be done for example GFCI outlets now he knows Uncle Bob can come over and do that because Uncle Bob's pretty handy. Could he do it at that time? Sure. But once the inspection's done by the buyer, then no, Uncle Bob cannot come over and do that. It has to be done by a licensed person. And the and so, for example, if a and it's an electrical need or a plumbing need, since both of those trades are licensed they need to use licensed people. Correct. Okay, now also, it says that if they don't complete the repairs prior to the closing date, then the buyer may ex exercise remedies or extend the closing date up to five days. That's correct. So if the seller, what's the best way to avoid that issue, Lori? Really, the best way to avoid it is for you to be on a timely schedule. So if you know that there are repairs that are needing to be done, I would say a week or maybe even 10 days prior to closing, go over and inspect. Find out if they've done it. Another good thing too is whenever you do the amendment in paragraph nine in the modifications paragraph, you could put seller to provide buyer with uh, invoices. Receipts. Receipts. Right. Etc. Maybe seven days prior to closing. That's that way, a great suggestion. That gives you a little time. That's a great suggestion. I think that's the best way to avoid that problem because I and I have actually had a seller who agreed to do repairs and then did not do them and said he didn't think they needed to be done. If a seller agrees to do repairs, they need to do repairs. They're contractually bound to do them. Correct? That is very correct. That is very correct. Now, another thing too that we, we I wanted to kind of interject because we have this a lot as well. Let's say that the seller is very handy. And let's say that the seller wanted to do a few of those repairs himself. Could he actually do it? Because after all, it is his home, correct? It is his home, but if he's not a licensed electrician and, and the buyer didn't agree to that, then I would say no. Correct. If they agree, then it's okay. But again, it has to be in writing, and that would be on the amendment, paragraph 9. You could put buyer and seller agree, seller will repair the following himself, and then that would take care of that. But again, you know, and this is really to cover the buyer and seller, wouldn't you agree? I agree, absolutely. Because... God forbid if they were to purchase the house, Uncle Bob fix the electrical, two weeks later they move in, house burns down. Who are they going to go back to? Exactly. Or if Uncle Bob didn't pull a permit to move the box, That's that right. can also be a problem that would come back and affect the, the new buyer, the That's new homeowner. True. So That's not true. a good thing. And the seller as well, because exactly. you know there would be some legal issues. <laughs> right. Right. Okay. Well, moving along, on page five... 
Lori, this is where I added to the contract that this contract becomes null and void if not responded to by 5 p.m. tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So why would you question me on that? I want you to respond quickly. I don't want to dilly-dally on this because, of course, time is of the essence. But that's correct. That's correct. And this is a hot market. And so if right. this is not going to work, you need to move on to the next one. Exactly. Now, on that particular issue, if you'll notice... Our special provisions is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. I did smaller. notice that. Not <laughs> as much space to add everything I like to add. That's true. And there's a reason for that. They want to stick with writing in special provisions. Why? Because we tend to write things that really are legalistic in nature. For example, special provisions really are supposed to be factual statements or business dis details. We're not supposed to put anything in that would that maybe you have a contract addendum or a lease or any other kind of form promulgated by TREC that you could have used. And what we typically see are things like, if you don't, then this. And that is practicing law without a license. If you put a condition, if you don't, if we don't hear from you by five o'clock on Friday, then we will not move forward and we will consider this contract null and void. Or what this if offer null I'm void. not the one that writes it? What if my seller sent me an email and said, this is what I want you to put there in number 11, that I have to have an answer by five o'clock tomorrow. Right. Now, principals can put anything they want to in there. However, understand that principals, like us, are not lawyers. And that certain words like the and and can be misconstrued by the lay person versus the legal person. So I would always counsel them, if you want something in here, you might want to talk to a lawyer. And again, same for us. If we are thinking we want to put something in there, our client has asked us to do that, we might talk to a title attorney or a real estate attorney and find out what can we put in there so that we don't get in trouble because we don't want to be putting, if you don't, then we will. So is this is this where I put, I want the media room chairs to convey? That's a great question and the answer is no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> because there is a form for that. You say no a lot, Lori. I know, I do, I know, no, no, no. no. <laughs> There's a form for that. Uh, that's a non-realty item form. And on that particular form, you could list media room chairs. And then in our world of technology, take a picture. I love that suggestion. Take That's a awesome. picture. Because we actually had a case where there were three sets of patio furniture. And the non-realty item said, seller will leave patio furniture. Now, which furniture do you think they left? Hopefully all of it. No. Oh. <laughs> and of course, they left the worst one. The buyer then comes back and goes, that's not the one I wanted. So guess what the agent bought them for housewarming? Oh, man. Yes. Ouch. <laughs> Ching. There went your commission. Yeah, okay. Exactly. And, uh, you know, all it would have taken was a snapshot, you know, and then you would have had, this is the one we want. So, Very good again, point. take so, pictures. So what does go here? So here's what you could put. Um, well, this would be a good place, too, to put if you're a licensed agent or you're related to the buyer or the seller. Um, it would also be a good place to put the owner's name. Let's say it's, you know, seven children and this is mama's house. And so you need to list all seven children. In that event, you could put C paragraph 11 and then put all the names of the children. It could be like maybe it's a meet and bounds uh, property description or a very long property description. You could put it in there. Um, you can also put clarity for details of the contract. For example... You were asking for 5000 in closing, okay? And then you want, let's say that you want the seller to provide a uh, survey. Is that inclusive of that $5,000? Or would that be in addition to the $5,000? Gotcha. So that would give a little clarity to the terms of the contract. Okay, well that clears that up. Yeah. All right, agreement of parties. And I just wanted to bring this up because, you know, I have been doing this so many years that I start on this page, page seven. When I'm first drafting the contract, I start here because I want to be sure I check every single box that I know I'm going to need so that when I do come back to it, I don't miss any. So usually I would check third party financing if they're getting a loan. I might check the mandatory membership, but it's easier to do it for me at the beginning, to start with this page, than to whip through it, trying to get it all done and forget to check some of the boxes, which I know you never do, Laurie, but I sometimes <laughs> do. 
So for example, I'm just, I, and I am curious because it's new. Uh -huh. What is this? I have my uh, buyer has a, ba uh, I noticed the seller has a gas grill on his patio. So should we check that addendum for the propane gas system? Well, the propane gas system is actually a new addendum that we have uh, that we just got this year. And that really is for something that is more in, I would say, like a rural area. It's where the only gas coming in to either heat the home, cook, etc., is propane gas. And so consequently, there's only one provider for that area. That's when you would use that addendum. And that actually has rules and regulations, and that is filed downtown at the courthouse and is attached to that property as part of the documentation for that property. Most likely, if you have a gas grill in a city subdivision, you're not going to need that. Because it's not because it's handled not by the propane gas system absolutely. service in the area. What if it's a co-op, a gas co-op in an area? Um, that's a great question, too. But typically with a gas co-op, you're not going to need this particular one unless that is the only game in town. Um, there may be a disclosure for the co-op, but not, not this particular disclosure. Well, if I could not put the media room and chairs in special provisions, mm -hmm. then which one of these addendums am I supposed to use? Well, that's a great question. Down here, there's a other space. Oh. And so you could actually attach the non-realty item, or you might attach an REO amendment or addendum. If it's a bank owned, then consequently, it would be attached there as well. Ah, okay, so that's where I would put it, the non-realty items addendum. We have a question. If the seller has an option to buy propane from various companies, is the propane addendum required? That's a great question. And in this instance, the answer would be no. This particular propane system service area agreement or addendum is really only when, I mean, I hate to say, but when it's only kind of a, like a monopoly. In other words, this is the only service provider in town period and so if you want gas or heat at your location then you must use this particular company so this is a, a situation where they are the only people you can use and, and it will be filed downtown as part of the property record and you're trying to protect your buyer to make sure they understand you don't have any choices that's correct this is all you have and we want you to be aware of that so we made a special form Make, to make sure that was clear. Correct. And on that form, it's like most forms, it will tell you that this could be in a service provider area. Consequently, you need to find out how much it's going to be, what the taxes are, the rates. Will your property uh, make the grade? Or, are there any changes that you need to make to your property? How is that going to work? So excellent question. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good question. Okay. Now, on the notices... Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. So let's talk about some of these uh, agreement of the parties. So for example, I know you were talking about HOA. Right. So if there's an HOA or POA, there is an addendum for that. Okay. And you know that changed this year as well. Yes, it did. I noticed that. Yes, so just to let you know, used to the title companies would pay for that for us, correct? Right. And they typically would order it and then they would collect later. Well, not happening now. <laughs> now they are going to require the money up front, which is a good thing. Um, but you will have to pay for that up front. And it can be either paid by the buyer or the seller, but the title company no more will take that uh, monetary issue on themselves. <laughs> so that's a good thing. We have a comment that perhaps the two of you could elaborate on. I thought that non-realty items were not part of the contract because it could affect the total price of the sale of the property. Great question. Um, the non-realty items are really, uh, they, they are as, um, and they are part of the contract, and the reason being that they're part of the contract is because what you're asking the seller to do is to convey personal property along with the terms of the contract. So this would be things like we talked about media chairs, um, 
you know, the play set, whatever, patio furniture. patio furniture, things like that, that typically they would take from the property because that's their personal property, but they are willing to leave. Now, one of the issues that we had is our old form did not have a monetary amount, okay? And the new TAR form has for the amount of blank. Now, just a little history on that. Appraisers would go crazy because appraisers were having issues with all of these personal items being involved with the sale of the property. So does that mean the property is worth more now because we have these items? And if so, are these items that are going to remain and stay for the next sale or will these be items that these people take with them? And then they're no longer part of the property. So the appraisers were trying to figure out, do we need to add this or subtract it? Is this gonna make a difference? Then lenders were looking at it and going, oh, this is kind of a nightmare because now we don't know, are we going to need to consider this as value when we're doing underwriting? So one thing that they have added with the non-realty item is there doesn't necessarily have to be a monetary value. Consideration is not monetary all the time. Just like with our, our contracts, we don't have to have earnest money. It's just a trend, but we don't have to have earnest money in order to have a contract. So consequently, you don't have to have a monetary consideration. It could be consideration that it's convenient that I don't have to move the pool table and I can leave it there. So for me, that's consideration. So you don't really, it is part of the contract, but it won't affect the total price of the property because of the fact that we do have that monetary line whether it's gonna be zero, $10, $1, whatever, because that is what principals have agreed it's worth. And so no more does the appraiser have to go, okay, what am I gonna appraise this for? It's saying here it's worth $10, it's worth $10. Does that make sense? I hope that answered your question. Thanks. Okay, let's go on to the notices because I put in here, and you were asking me about this, that. I want all the notices to be sent to me, and I've put in here to the agent at the email below, and I've included my email address. So what, what is your question about this? Okay, it, if, if you notice on the notices, it says that it's in writing, and it's effective when mailed to, hand-delivered, or transmitted by fax or email. Now, these notices in paragraph 21 are affected by a lot of people. For example, the title company, when they send the title commitment, will send it to the address on paragraph 21. Any notices that we have, for example, termination, needs to go to the address at 21. Now, typically what we see is the agent info where it's left blank, right? Well, I want to be emailed, you know, when I'm on my European cruise next month, <laughs> I want to be sure and get that notice. Right, and so it's okay to CC yourself, but I would just caution you that it needs to be the parties to the contract. We're not parties to the contract. And let's say that you only have your information on there, and you're on a cruise, and you're having the time of your life, but there's no email, there's no phone service, there's no fax. But guess what? I decide, oh, my buyer wants to terminate, so I send you a termination clause, and I'm well within my time frame, but guess what? I did that on Monday and you won't be back until Friday and the seller's rocking and rolling thinking they've got a deal and it's moving forward. Well, my cruise is gonna be longer than that, <laughs> but, but I do see your point. I do see your point. So, so I should put to the buyer's address or email. Right. And also to agent. I can do that. Correct. Okay. Correct. It's just good, good policy to do that. Um, if you're worried about them talking to each other, just get over it. They're gonna. They're gonna. It's just life. It's gonna happen. So, and if it comes back to me, if I'm the listing agent and I get this, uh, or excuse me, if I'm the buyer's agent, I get this contract back and the seller hasn't filled anything in, what do I do then? Um, go ahead and fill in their information. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead and fill in their information. Let them know I'm going to fill in your information. And like I said, you can totally CC yourself. I would just caution you about having you as the only contact because then you're responsible for all the timelines. Gotcha. Okay, page nine. I, again, I've been doing this a long time and I've always signed this. And mm -hmm. someone told me that I don't get to sign it anymore. 
right, that's a change. You no longer have to sign. You can just print your name. Now you do still need to have your supervisor information. Um, but you don't have to sign this form anymore. You oh, can just print. So up at the top where it says print name only, do not sign, that means don't sign? There you go. Ah, <laughs> okay. Well, good to know. And so at the bottom, this is where I fill in what you're going to pay me, right? That's correct. Okay, good. That's correct. Yay. <laughs> I'm going to always fill that one in. <laughs> always fill that one in. Now, usually that's found in the MLS. Right. However, if you have something that is a non-MLS property, or um, it's coming soon and you hopped on it before it went into the MLS or whatever, then you're gonna need to use a broker-to-broker -broker agreement. Or, or if it's a for sale by owner, you're gonna need to use a broker-to-owner agreement. Or you don't get paid. That's correct. <laughs> <laughs> so we wanna be sure that we you do You definitely that. wanna get paid. So if exactly. it's not in MLS, and it, it seems that there are a lot of properties that aren't in MLS these days, be sure you're covering yourself as a buyer's agent and get that broker-to-broker -broker agreement signed. Absolutely. Okay, now my question on this is who fills in the execution date? Okay, so the last person that touches it. Now there are gonna be four requirements. It, first of all, contracts have to be in writing, period. Um, all signatures and initials need to be complete. All the parties need to understand what they've agreed to do uh, unequivocally, and the last party to sign has to communicate that acceptance to either the other party or their agent. You know, there's constructive notice, which says, if I've notified the agent, it's as good as notifying the principal. Correct. Okay. But I can't. I have an issue with number three. How can I make sure they understand what they've agreed? Well, that's a great question. <laughs> And you know, it's just a matter of sitting down with them and explaining, okay, here are the terms of the contract, here's the timelines, here's what we're looking at, and here's what you've agreed to do. Do you understand the terms of the contract? So basically, pretty much what they've agreed to pay for, and the dates. Right. The okay. timelines, what they've agreed to, things like that. Gotcha. And it needs to be signed and delivered. So. Isn't this the thing that title companies say is frequently missed in a contract? Absolutely. Now, here's a question for you. If you don't have the effective date filled in, do you have a valid contract? I don't think so. The answer is yes, you do. Oh, right. I <laughs> however, got it wrong. <laughs> however, you will not have a baseline for right. all of your time frames. And should something happen, you may have to have a judge look at that and decide what the true effective date is. So always fill in your effective dates. Good point. Do we, how about some hints? Let's talk about these. Okay, you talk about those. Okay, well number one, make sure you're using the current forms, which obviously I wasn't, so there's been a new one. <laughs> there has been a change, so make sure you're using the current one. And then this is a good one. I've noticed as a listing agent that when I'm flipping through those bazillion offers that are submitted on my property, <laughs> I'm flipping through and quickly looking for those seller contributions and I've missed them because guess what? They moved them to the bottom of the page. Correct. This is also a good hint for you buyer's agents out there that are looking for seller's contributions that don't forget to scroll all the way down and fill that in because if you're looking for seller contributions, which is challenging in this market. It's at the <laughs> bottom of the page. And Lori, what about the seller temporary lease one? That What's that one about? Well, just to let you know, if the seller is going to stay in the property after closing, regardless of time frame, if it's 30 minutes, an hour after, it doesn't matter, um, you need to have a seller temporary lease in place. Now, understand that it's not required for you to have a dollar amount in the rent nor in the um, deposit. It wouldn't hurt to have it, but it's not required. Um, again, consideration could be consideration of time. In other words, thank you for letting me have a few days to move out. So consideration is not always monetary. Understand it is not equal to monetary value. And I believe Trek actually considers the sale contract to be the consideration for remaining in the property. It's not a t intended to be a long-term lease. Correct. So there does not have to be a dollar value in that blank. Correct. 
And there is new info for tenant occupied sales property. And if you are looking at investment property that has a tenant in it, then you, the seller must provide you the lease and the move-in condition form within seven days of the effective date. That's correct. That's so a new one. Listing agents, make sure you get that information to the prospective buyer. And then this hint, the title companies apparently have gotten cheap on us. No, not just kidding. They will not front the money for HOA documents any longer. Right, Lori? That's correct. That's correct. So someone will have to give them the check now for them to order those documents. And don't forget, buyer's agents, listing agents, don't forget your timelines on that. Make sure that all this is done in a timely fashion. And don't get excited and order the documents too soon because as we all know, those have a shelf life. That is true. And so where does this go? Where are you putting down who pays? Um, there's an addendum, an HOA addendum. And so you will put down who is going to pay and you have uh, basically four ways to do that. Either the seller will pay, the buyer will pay, uh, the buyer doesn't require the documents or the buyer's seen the documents. So there's four options that you can utilize. Gotcha. Well, Sharon has a question about the tenant occupied property. So again, you have a property that's being sold, it's MLS, and it has a tenant in it, a long-term tenant. They've got a lease in place, it's being sold as an investment property. And so the listing agent needs to provide the lease, the current lease and move-in form within seven days of the effective date of the contract. Correct. So this is not, it, it's not the same as a tenant that's moving out at the end of the month. This is a tenant that's been in the property that has an existing lease. Right, and it, it doesn't necessarily have to be a long-term lease. It could be that um, they're going to be in 30 days, even 30 days after close. And so this is something that they're going to have to deal with. So again, just to let you know, listing agents, you need to supply that within seven days after the effective date of the contract, not close, but after the effective date of the contract. Okay, and Nicole has a question, Lori. Where does she put the buyer's agent bonus? If there is one, we hope there is. Uh, where do we put that? Um, um, typically, you can put that on there. You can put your percentage plus bonus amount. So you could actually put that on in the nine. amount on page nine. Mm -hmm. Okay, and good time to allow for HOA docs. That's a great question, Michelle. That is. Because HOAs vary. It, it, of course, it's going to depend on what you've put as your closing date because you want to be sure and back everything up from that. But I would say I typically see from 15 to 21 mm -hmm. days. Lori, what about you? I agree with you. I think 15 to 21 days is a great time frame only because it's going to take them a little while to get the documentation out. And this is another good question. Can you elaborate on seller contributions? I'm glad you asked that because this is something that I want to caution buyer's agents about. I always get my lender involved when it comes to asking for seller contributions. Absolutely. And here's the reason why. If I overstate the seller contributions and I want $6,000 and there is not $6,000 of allowable closing costs that may be paid by the seller, that seller doesn't have to give me the whole 6000 They only have to give me what's allowable and what's on that HUD statement. So closing costs might be um, title policy. I mean, we usually put that on the other page, but an example of closing costs would be... It could be anything. It could be title policy, right. survey, appraisals, um, processing fees, underwriting fees. Lender fees. Lender fees. But the thing is, is you don't want to leave money on the table. So whenever you do that, make sure you check with the lender and you want to make sure the buyer is vested properly because mm -hmm. that can affect how much the seller can pay as well. Okay, and Mark has a question. If you have an amendment for price decrease and an amendment for addition for three more days to move, both sent at the same time, do you have to add the amendment to the price change amendment or will both forms correct way to send because of amendments? Wow, that's a lot of amendment, amendment, amendment. That's a lot of amendment. <laughs> okay, so just to clarify and make sure we understand this. So you went through, you have a contract in place. Now, consequently, you've had the appraisal done. The appraisal came back low, so you're going to ask for a change in price 
to accommodate for that low appraisal. And then also their seller is going to ask for three more days to move. Can you go ahead and just send one amendment form? The answer is yes. You can. You can just do it on an amendment because an amendment will change the terms of the contract. So yes, you could just do it on the amendment form. You might just, as overlap, you might want to add um, a new seller temporary lease. I think that would probably be a cleaner contract rather than addressing that on the amendment. But definitely the price is, is great. Okay, Marlis has a question of, okay, well, let me back up one second. Mark sent both. Okay, perfect. <laughs> so, okay, that's that works too. Yes. Marlis says, what is the best language to use in special provisions when a buyer requires a seller's response to an offer? First, my question would be, Marlis, are you an attorney? Um, if not, Lori, what do you want to say? <laughs> uh, you know, if you're, it, I, I would just counsel all agents to consider this. If you're wanting to put something in special provisions that your buyer has asked you to put, good rule of thumb, always contact your title company attorney because you deal with the title company and the attorney, they always have an attorney on staff. Check with them and tell them, here's what I want, here's what my client wants this to say. What is some verbiage I could use? And let them send it. The issue we run into as as agents, as licensees, um, is we tend to put things in special provisions and we use wording we think is natural English. However, an attorney will interpret that totally different. And so you need to be very careful that you're not setting them up or putting them in a position of jeopardy. So just, again, if you want to make this um, Part of the contract, get a lawyer to write that. If you don't, simply send a cover letter and tell the agent, you know, please respond by five o'clock on Friday. That's a great. That's great. And also, Marlis, when you get that, when if you go to a title attorney and ask them to write that, you can reuse that again. If they've written it once, they can. You can copy and paste it into another one. If your buyer really has to have that deadline. But the reality is, and Lori's really good at explaining this, is that is your buyer, you would ask your buyer, are you sure that if they come back at 5.05 p.m. and they haven't responded by 5 o'clock, but they do at 5.05 and they've accepted all of your terms, is your buyer truly going to say no to that contract? So typically a buyer is not, they just want a quick response. Exactly. And sometimes we, by doing what they want, we've actually set them up to fail. <laughs> exactly. exactly. So we, don't, we never want to do that. Always protect your client. That's my mantra. I've received a couple questions via private chat. Okay. The first one is from one of our participants. I always sign the contract. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? Um, I suppose if you want to sign it, it's okay. But however, the new verbiage says do, do not, not sign. sign. I so, thought that was clear. I mean, yeah. I we it used says do to not sign. we used to do it, and it used to be a requirement that you had to sign it. However, just to let you know, the new rules are you don't sign; you just print. And part of it is because you're not a party to the contract. Correct. You are not a party. And that ratification page, page nine, really actually, to be honest, when they were redoing the contract, they were going to leave page nine off. And then, because we are not parties to the contract, but there was so much pushback because we wanted to make sure we got paid, we wanted to make sure we had contacts, and so that was put back in for our benefit. However, we must always, as Valerie said, understand we are not a party to the contract. Great, thank you. Do you think it's a good idea to order the HOA docs during the listing phase because you know you're going to need them anyway? That's a great question, um, and, and yes, if you always want to be proactive. However, I would caution you in this particular instance, because HOA documents, they do have a shelf life, right, Valerie, about they, 60 days? They do, and then, yes, exactly. And you, you have to be sure that they haven't been amended with anything within that time frame. But yes, to get, to get the bylaws, to get the um, HOA covenants and restrictions, it's a good idea to get those, but just make sure that before you hand them off, there have been no amendments to them at all. Mm -hmm. That's true, because you don't know if maybe an assessment was added. Mm -hmm. um, maybe, you know, something happened in the interim that made a change. 
And then also, um, just to let you know, you can go online. If there is a website for that HOA, they are required by law to put their documents on there, their bylaws, their restrictions and covenants. Good point, mm -hmm. very good point. Amy? It wasn't too long ago that the one to four contract was updated. Correct. <laughs> right. What should you do if you receive an outdated form? Oh, great question. Well, that happened to me recently when I got a lot of offers on a property and one of them was the wrong form. It, it just so happened that it was because of multiple offers that particular one wasn't accepted. I did go back to the agent and say, FYI, we have updated the form. You might want to check your, I don't know if you're using zip forms. Some people don't use them, even though we have access to them because of our MLS, um, register, our MLS dues. But the, I would just at, tell the agent, let the agent know. But if it's a contract that you have wanted to accept, I would probably want it redone, Lori. Yes, you, you would need to contact the agent and again, be courteous to one another. Yes, <laughs> yes. And tell them thank you so much for the offer. Just wanted to let you know this is on an older form and so we are not uh, we are not using these forms. If you could please resubmit this to me on the current form, then I would be happy to present that to my seller. Um, because I don't know if you know this, you can be fined for using an outdated form. So just to let you know. Okay, I have one last question. Okay. <laughs> you shared with us today that in special provisions, we should not put any verbiage regarding we need a response by a certain time. But if we really, really want a response by a certain time, what's the best way to communicate that and, and even make it a part of the contract if possible? Well, again, the, the best way to do it and avoid practicing law is to go to a title company attorney, explain what you're looking for, and ask them to write that verbiage for you. Uh -huh. Yeah, and if you're not going to put it in special provisions, because um, nothing says you have to put it in special provisions. Again, I am all for talking to one another <laughs> and just con conveying that to the listing agent. Hey, you know, this is a really hot market and, and we're so happy you've got a great home. Uh, we want to make an offer. I'm sending you an offer, but here's the deal. If this is not going to work, we need to be able to move on. So please, please, we need a response by such and such time and such and such date. And we look forward to working with you. And another reason to not put it in special provisions is because if you do, let's just say you, I want to respond by 5 p.m. tomorrow, then as a listing agent, I'll come back to you and say, you know what, my sellers went out of town because it's Labor Day weekend and I'm not going to be able to get you a response by 5 p.m. tomorrow because they'll be on a plane. Mm -hmm. As soon as they land, I can, but that won't be until 8 p.m. So you've already, again, set up your buyer to fail by putting that in special provision. So I find it's better to, again, as Lori says, communicate that directly by either a phone call or an email, like this is what we're looking for and the response time frame. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Lori and Valerie.